on a Monday morning. Um, and I'm going to hand it almost directly over to Elisa Munoz of the International Women's Media Foundation. Um, I will just quickly say that it's, it's been a strange media landscape that we've all been trying to re-navigate over the past six months or so. And there's been a great deal of attention on domestic political press. So it is very heartening to see a room full of people who care about international reporting. And we're partnered with several organizations today uh, showing that there's a, a great deal of, of organizations and people who care about this sort of journalism. Um, yeah, so Elisa, I will just turn it over to you to introduce our three panelists and Peter, and we will try to get directly into the substance of the conversation. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much. I echo Glendora's thank you for all of you coming out here for this important conversation. When I saw who the winners of, the, of this year's James W. Foley Freedom Awards were, our three favorite people in the world all in one place, <laughs> we just couldn't resist giving everybody an opportunity to hear directly from them. It's not often that you have such remarkable women together, and we really wanted to make sure that everybody got the opportunity to hear what they've been doing and the important uh, things that they've been covering. So I won't talk too long. I just want to say a couple of words about each of them. Emma Beals, who is a dear friend to many of us, she is a major force in the creation of the Frontline Freelance Registry, an organization that represents freelance, for freelance journalists around the world. Um, and any of you who know freelance journalists, you know how difficult their job is today. She is also uh, largely responsible for the standards that have led to the creation of a Culture of Safety Alliance, which is an organization. It's an alliance of 80 organizations in 20 countries to increase the safety of journalists around the world. It's hugely important. The IWMF is a part of it, and it's one of the only real collaboratives that I have seen work for so long and so effectively. So it's a real treat to have you here today. Arwa Damon is a senior international correspondent for CNN who's based in Istanbul. Many of you have seen her covering some of the world's co greatest conflicts around the world, uh, focusing in the Middle East and in North Africa. I'm very proud to say she's also a 2014 Courage and Journalism Award winner. Welcome. <laughs> and Delphine Haggard, who is a stalwart working behind the lines to make sure that journalists stay safe. She's the director of the Washington Office of Reporters Without Borders, and I don't know where we would be without you, Delphine, so welcome. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to introduce also Peter Bergen, who's the vice president of New America and the director of the International Security Program there. He's also a journalist and knows very well the kinds of issues that these journalists face and that women journalists around the world are facing. So please, thank you. Emma. <laughs> no, sorry, Delphine. Delphine. <laughs> <laughs> Just putting you on the Are spot. <laughs> Delphine is going to start. No, I understand. It's much more exciting to hear from Emma and Ahua. You see, I have the Washington DC style. <laughs> I'm here to, <laughs> I'm here to give you maybe an overview of um, the threats and dangers that are facing journalists all around the world, and then we we will get into the exciting number. So just. To give an overview, yes, journalists are more and more threatened and targeted all over the world. Last year in 2016, um, at least 80 journalists, professional and non-professional, have been killed. And again, mostly murdered, mostly targeted in countries, of course, in conflict like Syria, like Iraq, and, and so on. I always, 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 always want to highlight that 90%, 90% of the journalists killed are local journalists. They are Syrian, they are Iraqi, uh, and so on. And it's the same uh, percentage for the number of journalists kidnapped. 90% of the journalists kidnapped in almost the same countries are local journalists. And um, maybe if I want to finish with one, maybe numbers, because today we are three women here, I, I want to say that actually last uh, year, five women journalists were killed, three were working for Tolo News, and their uh, minibus was um, targeted and bombed in Kabul, and uh, the other one was a Mexican woman journalist working in Veracruz, and the other one in Somali. Uh, so we see that still it's maybe 
the, the number of journalists, women journalists working in very dangerous countries are still not such a, a majority and that's actually maybe <coughs> the main reason why there's not so many journalists, women journalists killed or detained or kidnapped, it's because there's maybe less local women journalists working on the ground. Um, but we have two amazing ones who have been taking so much risk to, to bring us the news. So let's go behind these boring numbers and very sad <laughs> numbers. <laughs> but um, I, I think it's good to, to get this number in mind and just to remember that the, the deadliest country for journalists last year were Syria, Afghanistan, Mexico, Iraq and Yemen. And that's, um, of course, the countries where the, the highest number of journalists hostage remain Syria, Yemen, and Iraq. And the journalists in jail, Turkey, is now the countries where have the highest number of journalists and non-professional journalists in jail. It's, the situation is really crazy there, mostly for the local journalists. Uh, and it's now in the same super group of China, Iran, Turkey, it's really the countries where the situation is deteriorating in many different ways. I, I just gave so many different countries where in each country the situation is very different, but the dangers and the threats are, are here definitely to, to target and silence the journalists. Okay, well, I wanted to um, follow on from what Delphine was talking about and, and talk about um, one thing specific to freelancers and one to reporting on Syria and, and then a, a growing trend that we're seeing that sort of bridges the gap between the two. So, I mean, for freelancers, we obviously um, face the same risks as, as other journalists working in the field, the physical risks um, from governments and so forth. Um, but we also face a risk from within the industry itself, um, which seems, you know, particularly as we talk about um, press freedom more and more and, and the importance of the role of the press is the role that the industry needs to play um, in taking part in the defense of freelancers and local journalists because often they don't pay them well, they don't uh, give good conditions or they, they take a long time to pay. We pay our expenses up front um, and then go and do the work and then sort of three months later, um, once we've invoiced then it's gone through the accounting team and you've followed up three times, you get paid. Um, and so there are risks that freelancers face that are the responsibility of those within the industry within which we work, um, rather than necessarily outside, outside threats as well. And if we're going to talk about um, defending sort of press freedom at, at a time where it's, it's becoming increasingly critical, you know, making sure that we, we um, come together to face those you know, as an industry and we're not leaving behind sort of some of the most vulnerable in the industry uh, is, is even more important than ever. Um, and I guess one of, the, one of the interesting trends, I guess, um, covering Syria at the moment is how fake news is um, affecting the reporting that we can do from Syria. Um, and what we've seen, particularly since the Russians have joined the conflict, is this idea that you just need to sow a seed of doubt about what happened, and you can almost change the entire narrative about something that's occurred in the country. And as the physical risks in Syria have got higher and higher, and there's fewer journalists going in, um, none in some cases, um, what you're finding is it's very difficult to sort of get to the bottom of, of what has happened. Um, but it's still possible. It's absolutely still possible. But then when in this environment of sort of the lying corporate media and the MSM being the biggest you know, devil going, um, what happens is you only need something like the hashtag Syria hoax to start to sort of cast doubt about who was responsible for a chemical weapons attack or you know, who was responsible for what happened in Aleppo and those kinds of, of things. And it's really damaging um, for people you know, living in Washington or, or in the West who are trying to understand what's happening in these places because they have policy implications you know, in a city like this. Um, I was sitting with someone who's very educated stays on top of the news last weekend and he said, well, no one really knows who did that chemical attack, did they? And I just about sort of cried. I just thought, well, we're all running around doing all these things, taking all these risks, and how can you think that? You know, how can you be in doubt about, about what happened there? And so I think that's, you know, something for perhaps more discussion as we go into questions a bit later. And the third was this sort of um, 
trend toward um, vilifying the, the media, but under the guise of terrorism. Um, so a, a lot of the time, it's very easy now, you know, in countries that are looking to, to silence the media to sort of just cast um, aspersions about the press or a particular journalist as being a terrorist of some kind. And it's very difficult to push back on that. It's difficult to push back on it as a journalist, and it's difficult to push back on it as you know, advocates for press freedom who are trying to work in these, um, in these areas because it's happening everywhere. It happens in the West, it happens in, in Syria, it happens you know, across Africa. And it's, that's an increasing, um, I guess, trend that we're seeing, and it starts to undermine the role of those journalists. And then, you know, as Delphine would know, what you see is if people are facing physical threats or, or their status is being undermined, they become more um, at risk of, of being murdered or imprisoned. You know, it starts, they start to face those bigger, sort of more complicated and complex threats. So I guess that's the three points that I wanted to make um, before we jump onto Awa, who will tell us a bit more about field work. Great points, thank you. Um, I think just to add to the points that um, have already been highlighted, there's also this growing phenomenon of how the impact of journalism has become diluted. And how do we as journalists then try to combat that? How are we trying to navigate this new landscape where it seems as if despite our best efforts to highlight certain issues, to highlight certain stories, to take the risks that we have to take to tell certain stories, we're not seeing the same sort of impact generated by those stories on a global scale or even on a moral scale that we used to see, say, even 10 years ago. And I think that's something that we're all struggling in terms of trying to figure out how do we perhaps change how we're storytelling or try to alter it in a way, because now we live in a world where you can retweet a photograph of a little boy, Aylan Kurdi, lying on a beach and pat yourself on the back and say, I've done my share. I've created awareness because I've retweeted or liked on Facebook or whatever other social medium that is being used. And that's also a calculus that one then needs to take into consideration, especially um, for my network, for example, CNN, is what is the risk versus what we're going to get out of what we're doing. And you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that I work for a very well-established organization. We have all of our safety measures put into place. We do not face the same kind of security threats to a certain degree that some of the freelancers do because we do have a greater infrastructure. But that's not to say, of course, that it comes without risk. And sometimes you can calculate everything perfectly, but when you're being targeted by everybody, whether it's extremists on the ground, uh, ISIS fighters, governments that are trying to discredit you, you know, sometimes despite your best efforts, you still do find yourself in these vulnerable positions. Um, the other issue with being discredited on a global scale by, by leaders is that it then allows others to do the same. So when we hear rhetoric, for example, coming out from the United States trying to discredit the mainstream media, that then gets reflected in the reporting in a country like Turkey that then leaves um, especially our, our local colleagues, very, very vulnerable. And to highlight your point, I mean, I cannot overemphasize this enough. I am sitting here working for a major news network. I am protected. I am well paid. My local staff, especially in the days of the CNN Bureau in Iraq, they were the ones taking the risk. The reporting we do today, we do with the local staff, with the activists in Syria, with the people actually on the ground in Iraq, and they do not have this level of protection. Yes, they have some because obviously they are affiliated with CNN, but even beyond that, everyone else is running around getting all of the information that we use. They get followed to their homes at times. They receive specific threats. They are actually hunted down and targeted. There's an activist network called Raqqa Slaughtered Silently that's um, based in Raqqa, amazing group of very brave individuals. They were actually hunted down in Gaziantep. Two, two or three of their members were directly assassinated in broad daylight in Turkey. That's the kind of threats that they are facing. And it's, I guess we need to discuss different ways that we navigate this ever-changing landscape in terms of the impact of journalism, the risks that are being taken, the protection that is out there, and try to figure out how we move forward. Because we cannot allow the power of journalism to die. I mean, what kind of a world do we live in where we can't demand accountability, where we broadcast images of dying children and nothing actually fundamentally changes? And we really need to figure out a solution to all of this, I think, collectively, as the press, as members of the public. 
as entities that are trying to protect journalists so that we don't allow one of these main institutions that we have, these main concepts that we have, to, to lose some of its impact. Thank you all. Um, I mean, it's a sort of depressing uh, yeah, portrait you, <laughs> you Well, I mean, I, I guess it's depressing for, on several levels because I think mean, one of the things that you say, Ara, is about, you know, how do you break, I mean, you're taking these big risks and, you know, obviously you've taken a lot of risks um, and your pieces, your story from Mosul got a lot of attention. Was it, was it in November? Yeah. Um, but, you know, people have short memories. I mean, I remember well, one of the biggest story of all time, was at one point was that when the girls were taken by Boko Haram and everybody in the world was tweeting about it and it lasted precisely one week and then it was forgotten. So I guess this is a sort of broad philosophical question, which is, you, you said that, you know, 10 years ago, uh, things might have broken through more. I mean, is there or anybody, Emma or Delphine, I mean, is there a way of measuring that? Because I mean, I, I, it sounds right, but I'm, I'm just, we, we were actually getting quite a lot of coverage from Syria in one way or another, right? I don't think it's the volume of the coverage yeah. as it is per se the impact that it actually yeah. has. So, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when you're covering, just as an example, you know, the war in Iraq yeah. is taking place and there is a, an atrocity that has been committed. As an example, um, you know, the, the US military was bombing Sutter City. They said that, you know, they killed five Mahdi militia fighters with AKs. If you went out there and you got the footage that showed the exact same spot and actually showed that, okay, there were two militia guys that were standing to the side, but there were actually children picking through a garbage dump mm. and they were killed as well, there was a slight little shift. There was an, at least an acknowledgement of what had taken place and perhaps for a little bit of time. It's just on a very minor scale here. Okay, but one question I would have about that is, there were you know, 100,000 American troops there at the time, right? So that there was, I mean, I think there's, you can look at least in the American press, there's an inverse relationship between the number of American troops and the amount of coverage. So Afghanistan you know, is barely registering. It takes 140 people to be killed in one attack for it to even get to page A4 of the New York Times. So it, this, this is a sort of side issue to the bigger point you're making, but if there are Americans at risk, uh, soldiers, then the, the, the coverage seems to but, be. I mean, we take care of our own. I mean, yeah. it's just accepted globally yeah. speaking. You know, governments will take care of their yeah. own. Yeah, and there's nothing really wrong with that. It's it's. Uh, I mean, if there are British troops in in Helmand, the British press is going to pay attention to Helmand, right? So. But there was misinformation generally. I mean, if something like that happened during the Iraq War, you watched it on CNN, you read it in the Washington Post, and that was how you got your news. And if you were extraordinarily engaged you might have gone online and found a blog somewhere in the depths of MySpace from somebody in Baghdad. Mm. But that was for the very, very committed. And now something happens in Iraq, you can watch the Russia Today version, the CNN version, you can find a local blogger who's tweeting about it, you can find 1,600 different versions of the same event, and that's in one place in one country, and you, that happens across all of the sort of things that are happening around the world. So I think people are a bit bamboozled by that. Yeah, I think that it, I want to come back to the point you made at the beginning that the information is more deluded, mm -hmm. and it's it's hard to we need a comparison of what was the impact of the press ten years ago and now. But what's for sure is that now this uh, media bashing that we see coming from the U.S. but actually from the highest level of government in U.K. in France. Uh, is part of uh, this uh, delusion of what is true, what is not true. Mm -hmm. And also now more and more government have their own propaganda uh, media. Also all armed groups have their own propaganda media. So their information, there's so many inf cold information which are actually propaganda or which are information supported, uh, which support some interest that it's harder to to find the real news, mm -hmm. and that has an impact. I think it's maybe another way to, to, to put it because um, I don't think that each strong picture of photographer from Vietnam or from Bosnia changed the way the world reacted to wars or conflict in the past, but what did not exist at that time is that this numerous source of information which are actually propaganda. Yeah. I feel like we spend an increasing amount of time wasting our time 
fact-checking people's opinions, essentially. So you, you report on something that happened, and then all the other people who have an opinion or a countering view of it or have an interest in discrediting that information put out their thing, so about the chemical attack or what have you. And then everybody has to go back and do a second lot of reporting on it, explaining why all of these opinions or counter reports aren't true. And that's taking time away from resource of news organizations, from journalists doing original reporting that would help us learn something new. And there's a huge amount of resource being invested in basically debunking nonsense. I mean, I wonder if that's really new. I mean, the New York Times famously wrote in the late 30s that the Soviet economy was a miracle. It was, this, was the, this was the New York Times reporting that there was a miracle going on. And of course, this was Stalinist propaganda. So, I mean, the idea, like, and the, you know, the highly effective Stalinist propaganda, because the New York Times was reporting it as fact. Mm -hmm. So the idea, I mean, I guess, I mean, the, the, what is maybe a little bit new is, uh, is, you know, when you have RT and the Chinese equivalent and all these other entities that sort of, sort of pose as quasibly, you know, you know, sort of maybe, they have a kind of quasi um, feel of a news organization, right? So. Yeah. At which mm -hmm. something is happening. It's the scale upon which information is being disseminated and consumed. It's the scale of the different different yeah. resources yeah. of information that is out there. It's the scale of the targeting of journalists, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, unprecedented. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, the, it's the scale. Of, I mean, also, but also the danger. I mean, you can go on the ground and be directly targeted by an entity, or you can be targeted by the government as well. And more yeah. and more countries, and that's really shifting. Um, sort of the, the moral compass on, on a global scale. Has Assad won the Syrian civil war, Emma? I don't know, Carla? He has not lost. Um, I think, you know, wh when you try to define something that's as catastrophic and as devastating as Syria into either winning or losing, mm. it's, it's neither. I mean, Syria full stop has lost mm. on every single level. Will he remain in power? Um, does he have a much bigger chance of remaining in power and somehow surviving because of the Russian support? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think, unfortunately, it may end up being a long, drawn-out war of attrition. Uh, and I don't think we even, at this stage, really have a grasp on what it's going to do to Syria, to the Syrian population, and then what the ripple-on effects of it are going to be. And uh, just to add to that, yeah. too, I think the debate around Syria is a bit flawed. We need to to a certain degree, not just talk about what do we need to do to resolve Syria, we need to start talking about what happens if we don't resolve Syria on every scale. Not just what happens if we don't end the violence, but what happens if we don't address the refugee population? What happens if we don't address all of these you know, young, bright minds that are growing up in these decrepit situations, if filled with anger, understandably, watching their parents helpless, hopeless, having lost their lives, not having a chance for a future? What happens if we don't address all these different facets of the war? kind of the moral injury that goes with yeah. with just sleepwalking into a solution which seems like what's happening at the moment. Tell us, uh, Emma, what your organization does for Free Army. But what do you, what, give, give us a more, some detail about what you do for the people <coughs> that are, are coming to your organization for advice, for help. So with FFR, the reason we set it up was, um, uh, I don't know if you've ever met a freelancer, but, um, <coughs> Trying to get them together is a little bit like you know pinning down clouds, um, because they're off doing their work and they're busy and they're passionate about what they're doing and, and sort of getting organised and isn't isn't so easy and it gave the industry an excuse not to engage with us because you know you engage with one freelancer or another freelancer it doesn't mean anything, mm -hmm. so as much as anything it was about getting folks together. Um, and creating a body where we could have a seat at the table, where we could be represented in the conversations that were going on um, within the industry about how freelancers should be treated. And it was primarily sort of um, sparked by the British press deciding that they weren't going to take freelancers' work from Syria anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than a proactive approach, they said, well, we just won't do it. And of course, we know that's nonsense. Basically, what it would mean was that they would, they would end up sort of delegitimizing a transaction with a freelancer. They wouldn't stop doing it. If they want the news, they'll take the news, but they would give you 50 bucks cash out the back door rather than engaging in a proper way. So we said, well, if we get together, we can talk about this. So we did. Um, and so the, the biggest thing that we really offer folks is an opportunity to 
have a seat at the table at a time where the media industry is changing and freelancers are taking a bigger role, particularly in foreign reporting, to be able to express what it is that they need to do their jobs well um, and to have a constructive conversation with industry, come up with suggestions to show that they're professional, to say, well, actually, I take my job seriously, I take my safety seriously, and you should as well. So we, we've never been um, afraid of telling freelancers that they have obligations as well if they're going to take part in this, um, this sort of conversation with industry. So, but it also offers people a network. They're often you know, working in dangerous places. It can be a bit lonely, frustrating. So they've got a way of getting in touch with other freelancers who are in the area. Um, we help them get training or you know, discounts on flak jackets and mm -hmm. the, just the practical stuff that they need on a on a day-to-day -day basis. And it helped us when the American um, foreign editors decided to do the same thing as the British ones and say no freelancers from Syria, like that was a solution. Um, to come to the table and say, hang on a minute, we've already been working on this, let's all sit down. And that's how ACOS started, was because there was actually a group of freelancers that could come and have a constructive conversation about how to work together, rather than sort of just slamming the door on, on that arrangement, which as I said, it was never going to be a solution. Right. Now, to the extent that you can say, what is when you go into a uh, mo Western mode or, or uh, conflict zone like that, what is uh, what what sort of um, security protocols do you follow? Um, it, it's actually pretty extensive on our end. Um, it's usually depending on where we're going. Of course, I mean, it's a lot of research into. The, it's a lot of reaching out, you know, to the various different intelligence agencies within governments trying to sort of put together a, as accurate of a picture as we can. It's a lot of reaching out to sources on the ground. Um, CNN has a pretty solid infrastructure when it comes to how we operate, um, who we go in with, how we go in, how often we check in with the network. Um, we're constantly being monitored, whether we're being monitored or we're actually checking in with the network itself. We have a lot of protocols that are put into place. I mean, I have to say, all things considered, to a certain degree, I <laughs> And this is, you know, it's, it's part of CNN management's job, but I find them to be fairly protective of us. Um, but then again, as I was saying, even the best laid plans, you never know. So back in Mosul, I went in, uh, back in November, I went into Eastern Mosul with the counterterrorism division, mm -hmm. and all of the intelligence had indicated that ISIS had moved their fighters to the east. And we've been covering the lead up for the battle for Mosul itself for about three, four months at the time. When we went back and kind of di did our what lessons could we have learned, what could we have done differently, there was actually nothing that we came up with um, in terms of our decision-making process that took place that day. But long story short is um, we went through two, three neighborhoods fairly quickly. We got into these very narrow streets, and then the ISIS attack really began. And they just took out the back vehicle and the front vehicle, and the entire convoy was stuck because it couldn't turn around. And we ended up under siege for um, 28 hours. And I think the clear um, takeaway from all of that was uh, a certain level of appreciation that we still need to have for just how unpredictable ISIS can actually be. And, um, you know, a recognition that we should you know, n never to a certain degree kind of underestimate their capabilities and how they're operating. And that's just one of obviously the many threats that um, we face out there. We'll open it up to questions. If you have a question, raise your hand, wait for the mic and identify yourself. Thank you. Where is the mic? Okay. We'll keep talking till the mic arrives because we're getting live stream, so we need to hear your question on the. Um, is ISIS? Um, I mean, what is ISIS more dangerous than other than the Taliban, or these, or they're just? I mean, if it, you know, you, you know this better than most. I mean, they start. You know, Tawhid was jihad circa 2004, then became Al-Qaeda in Iraq, then became the Islamic State of Iraq. And at every single stage, those entities were declared defeated. And at every single stage, they morphed and came back even stronger than before. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of danger in trying to define this war against ISIS, again, in terms of winning or losing. Yeah. And I think when we try to simplify a battle against an ideology in those terms, we lose a lot of the nuances and the factors that then allow these various different you know, yeah. fighters or, or ideologies or leaders to kind of regrow themselves even stronger than before. Well, so the political factors that gave rise to ISIS are all basically still in place, more or less? I mean, we can have a son of ISIS, a grandson of ISIS, you think? A great-grandson. I mean, yeah. I, I just don't think we should under... 
estimate it. And I don't think we should be defining it in terms of winning or losing or just looking at territory. Because when you go out there and you say, oh, we're defeating ISIS, it, it oversimplifies a, a much broader problem. But certainly reducing the geographical caliphate has a, an of impact course, on its Of ability. course, but we do not yet know what their next move is. Yeah. What we do know is that what they've you, always had a next what move. What do you think it will be? Um, probably you know, more. ISIS has been very, very good, even when it takes you know, credit for or actions, mm -hmm. attacks that have taken place, or individuals who are inspired by ISIS. I mean, the smallest attack in Europe can cause massive fear. And ISIS is very good right now. And global leaders are playing straight into this. Exploit the fear of the other, create greater divisions, have us forget this fundamental reality that, oh, by the way, we're all human beings and we all more or less want the same thing. And let's exploit that. Let's exploit this fear that actually exists, even if we don't necessarily like to admit it. OK, is this lady here in the glasses, the sunglasses? Yeah. Sunglasses, maybe. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mei Jong. I'm a freelance magazine writer living in Kabul. And my question is about the Mosul Offensive. And I apologize if it was covered earlier. I got here a little late. I'd love to know what you guys think was done well as an industry, um, journalists going into Mosul, covering the offensives leading up to it and um, uh, up to now. And uh, what ways in which we failed? What was overlooked? Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> I actually think uh, Mosul was fairly well covered. Uh, there was definitely a lot of media, um, especially at the beginning. I think um, the, the lead up to it, perhaps, um, although all things considered, I do think that was fairly well done, too. But there's a lot of, and it's a bit different when you're talking television or print, obviously, like we're putting together two and a half, three minute news reports every once in a while. You know, you do get the longer report, 11 minutes. Um, on air. I think when I've especially been stateside and talked to people, there, there's two things that I've found that they're kind of missing. Is one, the nuances of what's happened and why is it that um, ISIS was even able to take over Mosul. There's an impression that the Iraqis should have gotten the job done a lot quicker, which I think is unfair because the US military in its history recent history has not faced the kind of battle that the Iraqis are facing inside Mosul. America's toughest fight in Iraq was Fallujah 2004, more or less, yeah. where 15 percent of the population had stayed behind, and it's about maybe a tenth the size of Mosul. The Iraqis are dealing with ISIS. They're dealing with over a million people held hostage. They're dealing with, and we saw this ourselves, every single house has a family in it. Um, and so I think some of the human side of the story maybe could have been brought out a bit more, um, something that I tried to focus on. And then the, the why and the what do we need to do to stop this from happening again. And you know, print has done a pretty good job in, in terms of trying to get into that. But again, this goes back to the consumption. I feel like we're in an era where people actually want their news. And what's Twitter, 120, 160 characters? Like if you can't put it into that, then it's going to just go. And, and I don't know how, how we begin to address that. Like, I, I know people are interested in reading long form. I know they're interested in watching long form. But how do we shift more people towards actually doing that? I have sort of a follow-up question to that. So uh, the military operation that take, to take Mosul seems to have gone pretty well. Obviously, it's a very difficult operation. It, it was never going to be quick. So, and it seems that the reason for that is the politics were worked out ahead at the time. So that you know the Kurdish and, uh, Peshmerga and the Shia militia aren't part of the; they're not inside the city. So what happens? And th that's great. So I mean, when I was in Iraq about a month ago, the main question was what happens after Mosul falls, and no one really knows. Um, but there's a lot of concern because everybody can agree that ISIS is a bad thing. But then they don't agree about anything else. So what, do, Emma and you and 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 Ara, what do you think uh, is going to happen in Iraq? Because Abadi is not Maliki, it seems, uh, but there are still big problems. So, what's your assessment? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been in Mosul. So um, I think it, you're very right, and and that's the problem is that this force that's going to actually hold Mosul, and I think the Iraqi government has a very short window to prove to the population of Mosul 
that it is not the Maliki government and that it is not going to be targeting them indiscriminately and mm. that it can actually keep them safe because the thing for ISIS to then turn around and do once they eventually lose all of the city is going to be to go after these soft targets like they normally do. And then, of course, you have the dynamic that's going to be happening with the Kurds who have already drawn their new borders in the sand and have absolutely no intention of pulling back. And that's not even necessarily going to be an issue for Mosul, per se, but even a bigger issue when it comes to Kirkuk yeah. and the oil fields that they have. And then, of course, you have the um, popular mobilization units, the basically Shia paramilitary forces yeah. that are kind of surrounding Tal Akbar but haven't fully gone into it. I mean, the window to get it right is so small. And the sad reality of Iraq is every single time there's been a window to get it right, the powers that be have failed miserably. Is a body going to get it right? I don't know. I have to say, he's definitely not Maliki. He was handed a wretched situation. And I think if we look at it today, given all of the different dynamics that he has to balance, he has done a relatively speaking decent job. But can he stand up to all the different forces that are pulling at him? Both of you have been embedded with the Kurds or have spent time with the Kurds. Do they um, want an independent state but understand that it's politically impossible? Or where, where are they right now, if you were to kind of characterize? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think there's, so there's been this broad realization that they, as badly as they want independence, that especially for Iraqi Kurdistan, they're still too reliant on the 17% that they get from the budget in Baghdad. Mm. Problem right now, of course, is that Baghdad's not really sending money mm. to them. Uh, and the <laughs> and um, I think right now there, there's a bigger shift towards independence, but it's going to be very tricky because let's also recognize the, the, the different Kurdish dynamics that exist within each country. <laughs> Yeah. Iraq's Kurds are not Syria's Kurds, are not Turkey's Kurds, are not Iran's Kurds. Ankara is willing to deal with Erbil. Ankara is absolutely not going to deal with the YPG. Uh, as a reporters, um, you know, when you, whenever you start talking about Kurdistan, there seems to be about a blizzard of acronyms, the PKK, the yes. SPG, the YPG, the X, you know, whatever. Um, it's very hard to understand. Uh, how do you communicate to the public? Uh, because it's important to understand, but how do you... How do you kind of make sense of all this when you're reporting on it? You hope that they give you more than 45 seconds to answer <laughs> the question. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I would say across the board, we haven't done a great job of it, to be honest. Um, and that's going to probably come back and bite us in the ass when it comes to taking back Raqqa and what happens. Yeah, I think, I mean, well, it's you, But it kind of articulate that a bit, a bit more, because I think it's quite an interesting point. So why, if you can't explain it, why can't, because the, the retaking of Raqqa is going to involve these groups, right? Mm. And, and if you can't explain who they are to the audience, why, why would that be a problem? Well, <laughs> it's going to be a problem because I think that in a lot of the media and the, the, the representation of the Kurds has um, been a little uh, fawning. Um, fawning. You yeah. know, chicks with guns, they're dancing with flowers in the mountains. And it's, <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> It's, ca it's not necessarily representative of you know, what the actual dynamics on the ground are going to be and what some of the, the specific tensions are when sort of Kurdish groups go into in some, of, some of these areas. I mean, let's not forget also the infighting that has historically existed amongst Kurdish groups. I mean, yeah. right now it's very much an alliance of convenience. That's not to say that that's going to be long-term or sustainable. I think, you know, for us um, on, on television, you, know, you try to sort of simplify it. And, you know, you have the Peshmerga which are the Iraqi Kurds. And then within Syria, you have you know, the YPG, who are the Syrian Kurds, the fighting force, but whom Turkey views as being the flip side of the PKK, basically one and the same entity that Turkey deems to be a terrorist organization. You did that in 45 seconds. And where it gets very, where it gets very complicated <laughs> is that America is allied with the YPG in Syria. That's straining Turkish-American relations. Um, yeah, yeah, actually. No, I, I think yeah, yeah, that, was, that was very good. <laughs> OK, another question? Lady here in the back dress. Hi, I'm Jacinth Planer with the Enough Project and the Century. We focus on um, violence and corruption in East and Central Africa. So this won't be a question about the Middle East. But um, one of the challenges that we sometimes see 
we work with local staff, um, whether technically freelance or other contract um, arrangements is we work with a lot of people who care so much about tracking down the information and to the point that they'll sometimes take risks that we think that they shouldn't. So I'm interested just sort of across the board from all of you, what recommendations or guidelines or resources and approaches you recommend for helping local staff better look out for themselves um, when they may see Im inclined to take risks that sort of take things too far because they care so much about getting the information, making the contacts, putting themselves out there to the point that they incur risks that we don't necessarily encourage them to take but that they want to take because that's how they're wired to do it. Thanks. Great question uh, and very hard to answer because there's no easy answer. Um, we can tell you that there are handbook, there are resources available on the website like ACOS, like FFR. They could refer to what are the safety guidelines that maybe Western freelancer use, but that's a start, but that's not enough. Also because there's already so much needs uh, for the Western freelancer going and which is not enough. I'm thinking, for example, that we're still working to try to get a decent insurance, health insurance for Western freelancer going to dangerous places. And the next step is to try to get uh, good healthcare insurance for the local freelancer and fixer. And that's, it's very hard. We're working very hard as a, a group through ACOS to that, to that goal. And I, I wish I could tell you, okay, here is the insurance you can go to, here is, it doesn't exist yet. So we have to work to, to make these resources available for the locals because again, yes, they are the one who takes the real risk. So we are working on it, but it's not. So I will um, encourage you to follow what the ACOS, the Culture of Safety Alliance is doing because that's really the goal of this uh, collaborative uh, action. But I think that's very interesting that, so, you're close to getting some kind of insurance deal for um, reporters um, going into these conflict zones that would be, you know, that would, wouldn't be so expensive. But right now, the, the the real cost of insurance is just is prohibitive, right? So there, there are already some um, insurance for Western freelancer going to war zones. Mm -hmm. Not s always so expensive, but now the one that Reporters Without Borders was working with for six years now stopped insure um, American. So <laughs> we don't have any more insurance for Americans. So Why not? I'll ask an American insurance company or <laughs> 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 we're not easy to deal with. Um, but so now through ECOS now we have many um, news agency, AFP, AP writers and um, CPJ, Reporters Without Borders, we're trying to see how if we come all together we can get better price, better coverage for the Western freelancer, even American. I, I think also the kind of what you're also talking, you also want to try to kind of emotionally walk them back from it. I think there's a very, you know, visceral reaction when you're that invested in a story of something happens, I need to get there now, 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 and it's almost overpowering. And, you know, one of the main points of discussion to have is like, okay, we understand, we know how important this is, but if we sit back and wait, say, 24 hours, can we get a better security assessment of what's happening on the ground? Is it going to be detrimental to the information that you're going to get if you wait 24 hours or even X amount of hours before actually going in? Are there different ways to acquire the information that you want, i.e., is there someone closer to where the incident took place who you can call? Do you? Uh, know somebody who might already be at the scene who can give you that information without you needing to go there yourself and give yourself that breather to actually do a proper security assessment of what threats you might face once you actually arrive to what it is that you want. Or if you're trying to uncover information about you know corruption or sensitive issues that might land you in jail or target you for, for kidnapping, um, 
are there ways to do it where you can better conceal your identity and conceal the identity of your sources, which may take a little bit more time. You know, we understand that, but in the long run, it's safer for everybody involved. And I think a lot of times, people just need to be talked down from that emotional initial, I need to get there, I absolutely have to do this. And I say this from personal experience too, because I've definitely had CNN walk me back from that. Mm -hmm. I would say the fact that you're asking that question puts you ahead of a lot of other people. So like, that's great that you're asking that question. But I would agree with that. So the, I mean, there's risk assessment forums and videos and so forth that you can get on the Roy Peck Trust website, RSO, CPJ. Um, and going through those, you know, and then really talking folks through, well, if you do this and we have to evacuate you from the country to live in exile because you, you know, dive in, what, how's that going to look? And if you sort of walk through pe people through the worst case scenarios and, and make them understand that that's actually a thing that might happen, um, and sort of facing the reality of what the consequences might be, it, it helps to, to sort of pull them back, I think. Gentleman here. What, May wait for the mic, sir, and identify yourself. John Foley, Jim's dad. Um, John. What level of effect does the need to be read or published or seen have on the risk taking um, that journalists, pho photojournalists, um, humanitarian, all, any any person in a conflict zone, um, war zone, whatever? I mean, would seem to me as a non any of those that that my career was involved in that, as well as my di desire to do good, that I would be pushed to want to be where some people didn't want to go so that I could see, do, and say things that aren't being done or said. So just make sure you do your risk versus editorial. You know, the first question I would always ask, or you know, when folks are wanting to talk through whether they should do something, is that risk versus the editorial benefits sort of equation of, you know, if you're going to be the only person to get this story and it's otherwise not going to be told and it's hugely important and exposes something, you know, dreadful that's happening, then your calculus on the risk might be different than if you're just going over to the Mosul front line as a freelancer because all your other photojournalist friends are and you think that you should. So sort of putting that kind of, what's the benefit, not just for my career, but for the, for the understanding outside of this event. Um, as the first question, and then going into the risk. And I, I also, have, I'm a, anyone who does this just for career is in this job for the wrong reasons. Um, I think a, a lot of the driving factors for all of us is, you know, you want to go where no one else is going. Not necessarily like the, the first process is not, you know, what is this going to do for my career? Is what is this going to do for the people who I'm reporting on? And what happens if their story? What happens to them if their story isn't told? Or at least that's you know, my and most people who I know's line of thinking. Um, because I think, I would like to think that beyond kind of career progression, most of us feel a profound moral responsibility. You know, even though we're talking about the fact that the impact of journalism is diluted, we're not gonna allow a sense of futility to silence us or stop Thank us. You know, actually, I want to go back to that point that actually we, we, we have this impression, and I share that impression, that information is diluted. But at the same time, if the journalists are so targeted and targeted, it's because what they're doing is still very powerful. Yeah. And that's why there's so many <laughs> different ways to try to silence the journalist and the information itself. Vera Cruz, Delphine. Seems to be the most dangerous place in the world for journalists right now, right? Yes, uh, the, and the, we thought for some time that the, the violence in Mexico diminished, but uh, last year and even last month um, was uh, extremely concerning. And we are also, uh, I have to say, disappointed by the lack of efficiency that of the, pl the plan that the Mexican government tried to put in place. And that's, that's very, um, when, when, you, when the government are not able to fight impunity at such, <laughs> at that level, and, and this, this impunity is really, e every 
a kind of every murder of journalists in the world remains in unpunished. So it's it's an easy thing to kill a journalist and to to not be afraid to one day face uh, justice, and that's uh, encourage, um, of course, the targeting of journalists everywhere, in in Mexico, but uh, in everywhere. Uh, this lady and then this gentleman. <coughs> hey, thanks. Christy Delafield with Mercy Corps. Um, it's good to see you guys again. Um, I just, my question is really about that impact as a humanitarian organization. You know, we're in Syria, we're in Mosul. We really want to tell those stories too. And what, what kind of techniques and tactics are you using to try to get that human story out? What are you experimenting with now? And how can NGOs partner with journalists to, to get those real human stories told? Um, I think for Syria and Iraq are obviously two very different things because in Iraq we can physically access what's happening. And I guess for me it's kind of, it's still down to that same principle that has always existed. If you can take these broader dynamics and kind of bring them together into one person's story, the story of a four-year-old girl who is covered in shrapnel who might be going blind because after her house was hit in a coalition airstrike, her father pulled her out, charred black beyond recognition, and then the ISIS fighters that still controlled the area would not allow them to leave for three days until they actually got physically driven out. That takes a lot of the complexity of the battle for Mosul and brings it into one four-year-old girl's story. Syria, of course, is phenomenally um, different and much more difficult because it's much harder for us to go into and access. And you know, in that case, we're, we're relying on you know, these networks of activists who we've been working with for about six years right now, of course, a lot of them have been you know, pushed out of areas like Aleppo, and it's even harder for them to access um, information. But I guess for me, it really goes down to trying to take, you know, we need to begin relating to each other again. Um, we need to begin listening to each other again. We need to not look at these images and turn away and think, oh, that's happening over there, that's happening to the other, but recognize that as confident as we are in our certain realities today, as confident as we are in the fact that we can have a gathering like this and it's not probably gonna get targeted in some sort of a bombing, those people that are going through the sheer insecurity and fear and terror right now were as confident in that reality back then as we are today and it shredded like that for them. I think the other thing is, that, um, you know, with a story like Syria, there's this perception that there isn't very much information, um, that there isn't data available. We don't know what's happening on the ground, and that's just absolutely not true. Um, there are so many NGOs working in the country. There's so many sort of organisations, you know, gathering data about populations and all kinds of things, and it's being hoarded for different reasons in different places, and it's not being shared. And I think the humanitarian community, as well as the political community, still have this fear that every journalist is going to take everything you say and just like put it on the <laughs> page and screw you over. Um, but with a story like Syria where the group of people that are still covering it in depth at this point is small and they understand the risks and they understand the dynamics and they had some background, um, there is an opportunity to be briefing them properly or for people to be sharing robust information more regularly with journalists um, and having an ongoing dialogue about the way that they might use it or report it um, without this kind of fear of the radical truth telling. Um, because, you know, then we get into these problems like we did with Aleppo, where you have this, the population data, for instance, this whole debate that went on forever about how many people were in East Aleppo. Well, if the information was available um, that was more accurate than the 275,000 number that was bandied around. And because everybody used the one number that was public, it kind of undermined a lot of the other reporting that went on in East Aleppo. So I think um, just trusting each other a little bit more and having sort of ongoing discussions. I mean, it's a little bit different with something like Mosul with a breaking story and people are maybe going to take those bits of information and get a, you know, a jump on their competition. But for some of the more complex stories, I think there's ways of um, like humanitarians and journalists having a, a more useful relationship that results in sort of better information. TV images of children being gassed by it was sarin did produce an you know, outcome from the Trump administration. What was your, your guys' reaction to that? And um, 
do you see any evidence of some larger sort of Trump administration theory of the case in, in Syria? I think it should be looked at, two, two things to say about that. One is that the, the reaction from a lot of activists was finally. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing is, it, I don't think it should be taken beyond the context of it being a single reaction to one action. The, the policy hasn't really changed. There's no broader plan to try to deal with you know, Syria in and of itself. And I also think that given the indescribable emotional roller coaster that Syrians have been going through, especially those who oppose the government, to see the U.S. step in like this gives them an injection of hope, but crashing down from that can be very dangerous on multiple levels. Yeah, I don't, I don't see it as anything more than an isolated incident. Um, was it the right thing to do? <laughs> well, I think that accountability is important, and I would argue that the, the last chemical weapons attack in 2013 with the lack of accountability that went with it was a turning point in the conflict and has had repercussions that will haunt us for a very long time. So in some senses, um, you know, accountability is important, um, but it needs to be kind of meaningful accountability rather than sort of theatrics. So I don't think that it will have, you know, vastly, will vastly change the course of the con conflict in the same way that the lack of accountability last time did. But um, I think the fact that there is, there was some sort of cause and effect shown um, is helpful. But if it doesn't come with a broad set of policies that are uh, meaningful and useful in, in resolving the conflict, then, I mean, its, it's usefulness is limited. Um, okay, so. Bringing, bringing back to the news and the impact yeah. of news, at the same time that um, the U.S. government was launching this attack. The trending hashtag on Twitter was Syria Ox. And just seeing that was for me. Um, Elsie Gabbard went <laughs> on CNN to say she wasn't sure who did the attack, right? Mm. I mean, right afterwards. So but she, had, she had been to Damascus. She had been to Damascus, yeah. and um, yeah, she was. She just said it wasn't clear who did the attack. So, um, so. Is it a mistake to say Assad must go? Was it a mistake to say Assad must go at the beginning? And is it a mistake now? Um, I, I think the problem is that if you're going to say Assad must go, you must be willing to put in the muscle behind that. Um, I, I think the big problem has been with you know rhetoric, whether it's Assad must go, red lines cannot be crossed, and then not having the muscle or the willpower or the capacity to actually be able to stand up to what it is that you're saying has, you know, uh, as Emma was saying, like it, it has a devastating impact that's very difficult to put into words. But if you just imagine, you know, yourself as, as a young Syrian activist who has gone out there, who has tried to demonstrate peacefully, who has probably been detained, who has seen loved ones detained and or killed, who has seen these promises and all sorts of rhetoric coming out of various leaders who by the way, it's very important to point out that despite the fact that Syrians and, and Middle Easterners feel betrayed by the West and by the United States, they still fundamentally want to believe in America and in America's values and in Western values when they ask for freedom and democracy. So to see these powers not stand up on a global stage for what it is that they claim to stand up to when other populations are asking for it, and then we wonder why it is that when they've been gunned down, they end up turning towards more extreme groups, not necessarily out of conviction, but when you're getting killed, are you gonna stand there or are you gonna go and hang out with the guys with the bigger guns? And that's the ripple on effect uh, of what happens. And I think it has an impact on the, you know, the fight against ISIS because that is an ideology. Of course war. it does. And if, you're, if you prove that your ideology, you're not prepared to fight for it and it doesn't actually amount to much, um, it makes that the sort of ideological war that you're waging on the other side of the country all that much more difficult because you're you're undermining what you're saying. But and, and the thing is, you know, we all know people who were activists, who so, some have stayed on, obviously, you know, uh, as activists, and I have so much respect for them. And some of the others, you know, a, a guy who used to run a women's clothing store, who was a moderate rebel, 
went and joined Nusra. Why? Nusra had the bigger guns. You know, two very close friends who were in these peaceful demonstrations in the beginning who had the same ideas of what they wanted Syria to look like. One stayed as an activist, and the other went off to ISIS and threatened a guy who was his best friend. I mean, what happens inside a, a person's you know, moral compass that allows them to break off like that? These are all issues we need to address and talk about to prevent it from happening. How would you assess uh, Nusra's strengths or weaknesses right now? And by the way, we're going to have another session uh, after this, starting at 12.15, that will include Theo Padnos, who was an American journalist who was taken hostage by Nusra and uh, was released eventually. Well, the thing that Nusra did differently than ISIS initially was to embed themselves into the local population in a different way than ISIS did. So when ISIS sort of took off out to the east, Nusra um, remained. And so until reasonably recently, they've had um, a degree of support from the local population, not necessarily ideologically at all, um, but um, because they didn't sort of go in with the big stick in the same way that ISIS did. And so that sort of put them in a, in a slightly different position. And now there's this very difficult situation where they are sort of geographically entrenched into areas that are civilian areas, where there's loads of people who want nothing to do with them, and where you also have a sort of countrywide strategy that involves relocating people from areas that were opposition held into um, Idlib, where Nusra are. And so you have this, I think this is going to be one of the more complex issues to solve in Syria. You have this issue where you have sort of American and Western counter-terror um, imperatives that involve getting rid of Nusra. But to do that, you're going to have to go and fight them in what is a civilian area um, where you have essentially, com through complacence if nothing else, allowed the evacuation of civilians, of women and children, activists, journalists, doctors from places like Daraya, um, East Aleppo, across the country into that area. So how are you going to sort of get Nusra out of that area without compounding the problem of, of disenfranchising and, and these other people? And they were viewed for the longest time as being the only ones who were actually protecting the population, bearing in mind that Nusra learned from the lessons of al-Qaeda's failures in Iraq, whereas I, and implemented a different strategy in Syria, whereas ISIS did not. But you also have, you know, even early days, you know, circa 2012, even in a place like Aleppo, people wanted Nusra to run the bread factories. Why? Because of their extremist ideology, they were viewed as being truthful and honest and they weren't going to steal the bread. And they were very smart in you know, acting this way and really entrenching themselves. I know their strategy for Syria was to embed themselves from the ground up, which I, I think you know, long, long, long term potentially poses um, a bigger threat. Is it in not inconceivable that elements of ISIS as they kind of crumble join up with Nusra? Well, they have been. I mean, it yeah. was interesting that when ISIS first came in, Nusra <coughs> hemorrhaged fighters to them because yeah. they had, to a certain degree, because they had basically yeah. big, again, bigger guns, uh, yeah. more power, so, more capability. So the reverse could also be true. It could, yeah. Gentleman here. Rick, and I'm a master's student at George Washington. Uh, my question's kind of taking a step back, uh, but where do you three see journalism going in the next 10 years, and how do you protect the integrity of your stories um, in the age of social media? <laughs> <laughs> so, lots of uh, question. Um, <clears throat> so, where do we see journalists going? Um, as a representative for a press freedom organization, I, what I've seen is that the trend, the trend is that journalists have never been targeted as much as today in a way this is unprecedented. So which, which means that where it is going is that it's more and more dangerous to be a journalist and in war zone, but also in our democracy. Actually, um, last week, we, Reporters Without Borders, we released our annual index. And what we highlighted this year is that even leading democracies are now more and more targeting journalists in different ways, using the judiciary or using uh, police. Um, and we have seen the number of journalists arrested in the US and France growing up this last year. 
And this is very dangerous for many different reasons. Um, but so when you ask me where I see Germany is going, I see that there's more and more risk and we need to defend it more and more. And we need to defend journalism because we need, of course, to continue to know what is happening. And um, what we like to say uh, at Reporters Without Borders is that actually we don't defend journalists because they are amazing people. There, some are, <laughs> but, but not all. And I can say that because I'm a journalist. <laughs> but uh, because really journalism, uh, the press freedom, is the freedom that allow all of us to verify that the other freedom exists. And that's why it's so important to defend it. That's why it's so important to talk about it, to talk about the reality on the ground, to talk about the threats. And that's why when you ask me where is it going, I don't know, but it has to continue to go because we all need it. I think just to add on to Delphine's point, I mean, we're fighters. And yes, it's going to be tough. But I mean, we are inherently fighters. Like we will fight back against the system. We will fight to get a story. That's what we fundamentally believe in. So I think even though, yes, it is going to be a lot more difficult to be a journalist, not just in terms of physical security, but maybe to a certain degree, emotional security, because it is exhausting to be targeted over and over and over again, whether it's on social media or whether it's you know not for myself per se, but for you know local journalists, whether it's death threats or all of these other aspects of it that they deal with. But we will not stop fighting. I think now is the moment where we really need to you know, come together and figure out how do we stand together? How do we fight back against this growing phenomena of global leaders trying to discredit us? But actually what I want to say is that I've never seen so much collaboration mm, yeah. between the media and the press freedom media working together to, to fight back. And so if there's one good thing of, you can put it on Trump, on different reasons, I never been working so much in collaboration with my colleagues. So that is very encouraging. And uh, to, to your question about social media, yeah, for those of us that aren't millennials, we're still trying to figure it out. <laughs> 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 um, but you know, it's, it's a different way of, of disseminating information that, you know, yes, as we've been talking about, does maybe dilute it, but it's also a way of reaching an audience mm -hmm. much quicker in ways that we haven't before. And I think we're still, we're still working it out. And I think that's OK. And I guess I would pick up on the social media and say that sometimes in my reporting, I um, think about what the response on social media is going to be and head off some of it in the report itself. So you're like, what are the trolls going to say when I say this? <laughs> OK, so I'll put like, something that counteracts that in there and save us all some time. Um, <laughs> Because then you can kind of, if you don't give them anything to pick up on, and you do know what the things that the troll, I mean, in the story like Sarah, you know who, what the trolls are going to say. You can kind of head them off at the path. Um, and I think that that sort of goes back to as well the, the where are we going to be in, in journalism in 10 years. I think the way that we adapt as an industry is going to be really important at this particular time. You know, there's um, the way that we're embedding new ways of reporting into sort of legacy media is um, successful, very successful in some cases and not so successful in others. So how, you know, how, how are we able to pull data reporting and 3D and VR and so forth into the reporting in a way that's meaningful rather than just playing with our sexy toys, you know? Um, and, and giving people a way to engage with the information that makes them feel confident that it's true. Um, you know, we need to sort of maybe address this idea that we all think that we have some sort of right to explain what happened. But the, the public are saying to us, well, actually, we don't necessarily think that you do. So what can we do to, to rebuild that trust? And how can we use some of the tools that are available to us to facilitate us to do that, rather than just to you know, show that we have the, the shiniest camera? What about, um, to what extent do you, either of you use encryption when you're in these zones where the government is hostile, uh, the people you're working with are, um, you may need to hide their identities and the sources of the people you're talking to? And um, you, you do when you need to. Um, yeah. Or sometimes when you go into some countries, uh, you take a burner phone with you. Mm. Um, I think you know protecting sources is one of our cornerstones. Um, yeah. it, it, it's absolutely vital. 
Emma? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, all, it's just thinking about what the risk is in any given, mm. given circumstance. I mean, the risk is different if you're scared of the government versus if you're scared of, you know, a, an armed group over there or, um, and, and choosing the appropriate um, form of communication or encryption for the risk. That you're By the way, you mentioned and Trump in this context. Then oh. I want, can I say that actually we have seen that protection, protecting your source and using encryption is actually even very useful in Germany, in UK, in yeah. Canada, in the US, where we have seen more and more cases. Do you know that in Canada there's like many journalists who are under police surveillance? And you hear of things like that, you're like, what, Canada or Germany actually just passed a law which allowed them now legally to, to monitor any non-German person, including journalists and lawyers. So I just assume my phone's monitored at all yeah. times. No. Yeah. By various <laughs> different entities, and every once it's in a, a while there's assumption. a bit of a strange buzz where I hear myself talking back to myself, and I'm like, oh, yeah. you too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, it was the Obama administration that employed various aspects of the Espionage Act to either try and imprison journalists or their sources more than any administration in previous history. So I, I, don't, I think it's dangerous to say somehow Trump is, I did see a story that Ryan Priebus wants to, who was talking about um, expanding libel laws in a way that would be disadvantageous to journalists. He said this yesterday. So uh, I don't, but I think this is a bipartisan thing. This is yeah, not. You know, uh, there, there's been a trend, broadly speaking, towards this on a global level. Here. Hi, I'm Holly Jensen. I work for the Department of State. And I want to go back to a, a statement you made earlier about switching, shifting the conversation back to the human side of these stories. What lessons do you think we can take from the storytelling that came out of Iraq from 10 years ago? Do you think that was a failure on journalists' parts to not highlight the humanitarian, <coughs> excuse me, the humanitarian side of what was happening on the ground in Baghdad as we moved through Fallujah, and then what lessons can we learn to apply those lessons to apply that to what's happening now in Syria? Um, I think the, the problem with Iraq in the old days, and I, I plot back a lot on this because I started reporting in Iraq in 2003. Um, we were kind of fighting a different kind of fight back then um, in, in the sense that we weren't being discredited as the media, but when we reported something from both the U.S. administration side and the U.S. military, we were slammed left, right, and center for only focusing on the bad news, for only focusing on the, the tragedies that were unfolding and that we weren't reporting good news. And because of that mentality, the administration and the military either deliberately or out of a level of ignorance that I still cannot fathom, did not acknowledge reality on the ground in Iraq. And when you do not acknowledge reality on the ground in a war zone that that's, is that complicated, you end up in the situation that you end up in today. Could we, should we have done things differently back then? Were there ways to sound the alarm bells? We were all collectively trying to sound back then. That is something that we need to, you know, uh, in, in a different forum, go back and really reflect on. Because I think those of us who reported Iraq and back then, people didn't just really drift in and out of the store. You went in and you, you stayed for the long haul. Um, we were trying so hard. And we would go into these briefings and backgrounders and get shredded to pieces by people who were sitting in Humvees or inside the green zone about how we didn't know what was really happening. And then, of course, those statements were made publicly. So it was a different battle you know, back then between, I guess, the media and, and those in power than it is today. But it was still a battle to try to get information out there to a certain degree, and I guess you know, the narrative that we saw versus the narrative that the administration wanted the world to see. Lady? I'm Paula Kassig, mother of Abdul Rahman Peter Kassig. And my question regards ransom. I, that's not what I mean. Kidnap insurance, the pros and cons of it. I can see where a con is that it could falsely give somebody the assurance of security that's not really there and they're 
thereby, thereby embolden them to take more risks than they would. Um, I'm wondering if you see a place for it in the next 10 years that you're talking about, what will be happening in the next 10. Thank you. Um, it depends where you're reporting. So there's lots of places where having KRE insurance is really helpful because the kidnap is a transactional process and it's non-terrorist groups and you can get a ransom paid and get out quite quickly, I think. Um, there's other, of course, it's always going to be useful. Um, for freelancers, it's cost prohibitive. Um, it's not something that employers will cover, um, which is a problem because even when, even when you're dealing with a group that a, a ransom can't be paid to, um, having an advocate, having someone who has been employed to follow up your case day in and day out is, is enormously helpful. Um, you might have views on that. I don't know what insurance we have. <laughs> um, no, I think, you know, it's a huge debate about, you know, the whole logic behind paying or not paying for hostages. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's someone's life. And I think we just, you know, we need to look at as to whether or not the strategy of not paying and not negotiating has actually changed anything, which I don't think it necessarily has. It doesn't make you less of a target if you say to a kidnapper, well, my government's not going to pay. I mean, let me just interject because, because the Foley Foundation gave us, um, and, and Hostage US gave us uh, 1,200 Western uh, cases of people being kidnapped, and the outcomes for Americans were twice as bad as any other group. The only people, the only other group that had outcomes that were even close were the British, who also don't. Uh, so now, you know, separating out the question of, are people being killed because the ransom is not being paid, or is, it, or is there some political dimension because people are being targeted because they're Americans? But I think we came to the conclusion, I mean, it's a simple fact that when you look at the ISIS prisoners, uh, met almost all the Europeans got at, and they were all paid. Um, and I, you know, I'm not as brave as people on the stage, but I, one of the things I most object in this discussion is the idea that, well, and you hear this sometimes from in, you know, reasonably educated Americans, well, people are in dangerous places, and therefore, you know, they get taken, and it's kind of their fault. And, uh, you know, the, of, of course journalists are in danger, dangerous places, and of course aid workers are in dangerous places, because that's where the need is. Uh, we're not sort of in great, we're not covering what's going on in, you know, in Sweden because Sweden is relatively tranquil. There are no aid organizations working in Sweden in any meaningful way. Um, and so by the law of averages, <laughs> by the law of averages, it's going to be journalists and aid workers who are going to be taken because they're, that, they're the people that are in these places. Um, but yeah, so it is a simple fact that not paying ransom certainly increases the likelihood of having know, uh, a bad outcome, um, and that is a simple, that's a simple fact. The other thing I find interesting about that argument you just made is that, um, you know, there's this, this thought that, like, journalists and aid workers haven't essentially been used as, as a soft, lever, soft power lever for, for decades by, you know, the American government, British government, you know, New Zealand government, um, and then, you know, when you get into trouble, it reverts back to, well, you're just a silly civilian. It has nothing to do with, you know, the, the ideas of, of the country that you're from. I, I guess that's uh, one point is that when you're kidnapped, the, there's the question of uh, kidnapping insurance. But I think that your citizenship is even a more important factor. And who kidnapped you, if it's a criminal organization or if it's a terrorist organization, makes, a, I think, a bigger difference than if you are covered or not. And talking about journalists, we know that freelancer will never be able to have uh, kidnapping insurance. So then it's more back to, well, yeah, who kidnapped you and what's your passport? This is a very good segue to the fact that at 12.15, we're going to have a whole session that will be about this <laughs> issue. And Theo Padnos is going to be part of it, and Rachel Briggs from Hostage US, and Diane Foley from the, <coughs> from the Foley Foundation. Um, so if you would like to come and hear a, a, a deeper discussion of this particular issue at 12.15, um, we'll be holding that. Are there any other questions before we wrap up? We'll take one more. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm Laura Kelly. I'm a reporter for The Washington Times. I was previously in Israel and the Middle East. 
Um, question of whether you agree or disagree on international reporting, if it's accurately conveying kind of the majority opinions in countries when we're telling stories about them. I always felt when we were reporting from Israel, we weren't showing exactly how strong the right wing was, and people were really surprised when Netanyahu won the election. And I feel I see that in other countries too. So if you agree, you know, what can we do? If you disagree, what am I missing? Well, there's been these moments, I think, for those of us covering Syria in particular, where it's been like, what the heck were we doing this all for? You know, when, when there was the, the picture of the Lillian Cody, and suddenly everyone was like, all about the refugee crisis, which of course was a huge story and a, and a big issue, but it was as if it was happening in a bubble and no one seemed to understand where these people were coming from or why. Um, and this one sort of social media picture had more cut through than all of the stories we'd been writing about Syria for, for a couple of years that would have given you a fairly good indication that there might be a whole bunch of people wanting somewhere else to live. And there's been a couple of those sorts of things where you think, well actually, you know, whether it's the majority opinion or not, where somehow we're not getting the, the scale or the reality of the, the, the millions of people who are sitting there, you know, waiting for the conflict to end to go home across particularly effectively. And I think, you know, just actually sitting here and listening to all these discussions taking place, um, there's so much information that's out there. There's so many ways to get information that, you know, we also need to kind of figure out a way to encourage the public that's consuming news to go out and seek information themselves. You know, don't just watch CNN. If you see something on CNN, if you're focused, interested, want more, go and read a newspaper article about it. So maybe what we need to start figuring out how to do is how to grab one, someone's attention, take, for example, the momentum that was generated after the horrific image of Aylan Kurdi of, you know, Omran sitting in the back of that ambulance wiping the dust off of his face. and turn that into something that's going to somehow motivate the general public to go out and seek more information of their own. Because I think there's also a bit of apathy when it comes to, A, what's happening, but a lack of enthusiasm for wanting to go out and seek more knowledge yourself in terms of the general public. But that being said, once people are interested in something, you do see more interest in it. You do see more research being done. You do see more questions being asked. We just, I think, maybe need to figure out a way to capitalize on that momentum when it peaks for stories or even begin to generate it ourselves, given the way that information is being circulated right now. I want to thank our wonderful, distinguished panelists.